David with No Chaser, and we'll get right into it. Today's topic, I want to propose kind of a question, a question that um, unfortunately is on a lot of people's minds out there. I know it was on the minds of loved ones that were around me, and the question comes down to this. When do you give up on an alcoholic or addict in your life? Now, I mean, this type of question, obviously it, it varies. I mean, there's always degrees to this type of stuff because, you know, you could be talking about a good friend and how much do you help them? And then, you know, for some people, you could be talking about their son or their daughter. And, you know, that, that I believe the, the parent to the child is the only truly unconditional love in this world. And sometimes they'll never give up. You know, I mean, one of the weird things is that addicts and alcoholics who have children that become addicts and alcoholics, they they have a different perspective. And if they're in recovery, they kind of intimately know the reality is, is that the addict or alcoholic has to seek help for themselves. But even then, it's, you know, it's impossible. How do you give up on a child? But I mean, this could cover the spectrum of, you know, if it's your parent, if it's your spouse, especially, um, you know, regardless of what age, if you're young in your marriage or your relationship or older, or, I mean, it covers a whole gamut of, you know, this spectrum of your love and devotion to somebody. And I mean, really, you know, I, I hope this is like informative to some people, but it's almost kind of like a, an interesting sort of philo philosophical question. Now you'd expect, especially with me being an, an alcoholic, um, that the answer to that question when you give up is never, but if, you know, I, I always try to be candid and honest here, and I, I believe at least that that is not the answer. It, it really isn't because there is only so much you can do for somebody caught in the midst of of addiction. There really is. I mean, one of the one of the true like cruel tragedies of this affliction is that nobody, no amount of love from others can get somebody to do to get sober or clean. It, it just for whatever awful reason, it just, it doesn't work that way. So you think about the idea of like, well, how much do you put in? You know, there's, there's questions. I mean, this is a whole different topic for another day, but like the idea of like enabling somebody and that type of stuff. But, you know, I, I think of it this way and what kind of spurned this topic on was I was talking with a, a, a another friend in recovery who unfortunately had one of their close friends die, die at a, a basically a young age, like in their thirties, like a very young age to die. And it was due to alcoholism. And, you know, the thing was, was that what there was, there was guilt that came upon him because he had kind of like cut him out of his life, you know, because he was just like, he kept relapsing and he, he didn't seem to want to get better on his own. And, you know, I've always thought of it. And again, this is just my perspective, but I think when you are with a, you have a person in your life that you care deeply for, and they have some sort of internal affliction, whether it be alcoholism, addiction, mental health struggles, all that, all that type of stuff. There's, there's kind of these two big fears that come up. And the one fear is the idea of, I didn't do enough. If only I would have done this, or if I would have answered that call that one night, or if I would have just gave them another chance, if I would have let them back into my house, gave them shelter, just, if I would have done something. If only I, I, I should have done more. That's one of the big fears. But I think in my mind, there is another fear. One that is like kind of underneath the surface of that, that to me is the scarier fear the scarier reality to a lot of this type of stuff. Because in a way, and this may sound crazy, but it's almost more mentally palatable to take on the guilt rather than what is behind the second, and I believe bigger fear. And that bigger fear is the reality that there is nothing you really could have done for that person. That, that sense of powerlessness and helplessness to, to save a person in your life is is almost for too much for someone to bear so much so that they they would rather take on sort of even a survivor's guilt or they would take on this burden of that they didn't do enough because I, like i think for some people it is just it's easier to believe that than to believe you could have done nothing at all and this was just the fate that was set out for them now i mean that crosses into a bunch of different you know deeper you know existential thoughts but you know i i believe that a lot of times when it when it, especially when it becomes the 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 relationship you have with that person ends in tragedy and ends in death or they're in prison for the rest of their life or they've done something to themselves where they're just completely irreversible whether physically or mentally you know i, I think those two big fears come on and you know people don't ever want to experience those and it becomes a real question of how much should i do because you know i know that a lot of people Especially, I mean, this is one thing I'll come right out and say is that 
alcoholics and addicts are unreliable and when they're in active addiction they're unreliable and selfish and just and frustrating to like the deepest cores like I, I just i still even though i try to practice self-forgiveness and i know that holding on to guilt and shame is not good for me i still just so deeply emotionally cringe at the way that i i was and i try to keep that in mind so i don't go back out again and you know it's it's really hard to I, like I know there may be a lot of people out there that they they aren't addicts and alcoholics themselves, and it's just it's incredibly hard to understand because you know I used to tell a lot of people when they're just like you know David, this makes no sense how you keep doing this. This is insane. Why would you keep doing this to, to yourself? And maybe there was some point in my life where I'd come up with some sort of reasoning or try to like wrap you know something in this nice dressing and then you know wrapping paper of like well it's because of this and this and. You know, the, the truth is, and I eventually started doing this, I just go, you know what? You think this is insane? I think this is insane too. I don't know why I do this. I don't want to do this stuff. You know, I mean, it's not a very satisfying answer because it doesn't, it didn't come with the actual change that they were hoping for. Now, the one way I break this down of when you, you know, that again, that question of when do you give up and give up might be too kind of harsh of a term, but what, like, when do you have to kind of just surrender to this person has to live their life and they can only get better on themselves. And I have to, you know, it's too hard to watch to just to keep in their life and just, you know, look through the window into their suffering. So I have to just like kind of cut them off, you know, and I, <clears throat> this brings up to something personal about myself is that, you know, one of my like biggest and at a certain point became the only supporter was, was my mom. I mean, believe me, I was like, I was so hopeless and for such a long amount of time. And I, I just, I always got to a point where I, I didn't want my mom to, to care for me. I didn't, I wanted to reject everything she was doing in the support because I just, I was hopeless. I had no faith this was going to work out. And I was just like, you're wasting your time. Now realizing that, you know, we're talking about that unconditional love. It's like almost, she didn't have a choice in it. And I remember there was one point where, you know, as time would go on, I'd have more honest and candid talks with her, you know, only when in times of sobriety. And, you know, she would, you know, I would talk to her about that. I was like, did you ever like give up or like think I was a lost cause? And she was like, sure I did. And there was a part of me that was like, what you did? <laughs> and it was like, what, what are you talking about? I didn't believe in myself. Believe me, if I could put bets on whether I was going to make it or not, I would go all on black, baby. <laughs> Bet the house on that. Um, but, and this is not to say I'm cured now, but I'm in a much better place. But, you know, I, she was just like, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't think it was going to work out. There's just too many failures, but I couldn't give up on you. And there was a part of me that thought like, well, that actually makes it a lot more beautiful of a gesture to keep giving support, to keep putting in time and emotion and effort to even to something you think would fail is, is even more remarkable. But even as time would go on and more conversations would happen, you know, I, I realized there was actually an, even another layer to it, which was that what she was doing for me wasn't actually for me anymore. What she was doing was that in what became in a lot of people's minds, the inevitable when I would die or be incarcerated for the rest of my life or kill myself or be killed or in some, you know, just basically devastating way, she would at least, she would have built up enough to where she had tried enough to where she could, even in the tragedy and the grief that would come with it, she would be able to rest her head at night because she would know that I did everything I could. And that was one of the things where I realized that a lot of what she did for me over the years was actually for her. So that if it, it came to this tragic ending, at least she would know that I, I did everything I could. I, I hate this reality. I hate that it turned out this way, but I did everything I could. And to me, I, I think about that. And I think really that's kind of the, the answer to this sort of question. It's like when you should give up. And I, I think that, you know, if you have someone in your life, and again, we talk about the degrees of like, you know, obviously you're not going to do for your own child what you would do for a good friend or, you know, things like that. But I, I think the, the right amount is to just do when you believe what you could realistically do. And I, that realistically is a very important word because, you know, if you think about like, I did everything I could, you know, doing everything you could is, can be negative in a way too, because it's not like doing everything you could and shouldn't be like, oh, I kept, you know, coming to their house every day and I, I kept clamps on them and I promised I'd take him to Disneyland and then I took him to rehab or like I did all these things. It's like, no, in a sense of like, you know, if you could come to the idea of what was actually going to be beneficial to them and you went forth and did that effort for that, 
you know, which is not enabling and which is not just this like hopeless kind of control where you can't just like, you know, come to accept what this person's, you know, affliction is, but just enough to where you can, you can have the understanding of like, if this doesn't turn out and they never get better, which is a very harsh reality, but if they never get better, I did everything I could. You know, and like I said, this stuff is also very fluid in a sense to where, you know, some people and it depends on the person's temperament or their view of addiction or their view of just what life is. You know, some people may have had to cut themselves off. And then when they see progress of the person, they, they kind of come back. You know, the, a lot of this is about like building trust. And, and, you know, when you can start to see the cracks of hope, like that was one thing that had devastated a, a, a long relationship I had before this was it wasn't how long I had suffered in active addiction and drinking it was that uh, there was times where i would get sober and i'd turn my life around and things would get better and then i'd go back and that was in a way almost worse it almost would have been better if i would just been drinking the whole time even longer than i did but then turned it around it was that i kept getting better and then i would go back so then there was never any trust there was never any hope and even the good things that came because it was always this sort of deja vu would be like all right well when's the other shoe gonna drop and so, I, I, you know, I think when, it, if you have someone in your life and you're, you're wondering like, like how, to what end, you know, that classic question that can cover so many deep things in life, like to what end, you know, I, I think it's the best to have a real sort of honest conversation with yourself and think, okay, you know, you can get help from other people, from professionals, not just dudes with the YouTube channel, but you can talk about like what the person actually needs, what you can actually do. And then from that point, just do enough to where, you know, if you can imagine, you can visualize it not turning out in the worst case scenario happening, it would be awful. It would be tremendously sad and devastating, but I done everything I could and I just have to let life be what life is. On that very grim note, thank you for watching this <laughs> channel. <laughs> like, subscribe, do all the, yeah, oh, God. No, I do appreciate it watching. And I hope this could at least be helpful. Even if it's not informative, just comforting knowing that this, this scenario happens with a lot of people, whether you're an alcoholic or not. Um, so I wish everybody, everybody the best out there and be well.